Okay, great. Started. Let me check. Okay, I guess, yeah, let's start it now. Okay, so once again, uh, very good morning to everyone. Uh, so today is the open summary session for week four. So I guess in the previous two sessions, Nalindra would have, you know, tried building a simple JavaScript app. And after that, he would have converted it to a, uh, a view based app. So we are going to, you know, do a similar kind of stuff here in this session. So I hope all of you are aware that uh, for this course, we are not having any specific lab assignments that are going to contribute to your final course grade. But yes, we do have uh, a few practice lab assignments that are given entirely for the practice purpose. They won't be graded as such, like uh, they used to be in your previous modern application development one course, but uh, they are here just for your practice purpose so that uh, you can you know, practice the concepts you are learning uh, week by week. So in this session, I am planning to. Sir, uh, I have a doubt. Actually, last session that YouTube link is not available, sir. Would yeah, yeah. Share I'm aware that of thing. that. So I have actually shared the recording of that uh, session on the discourse. One of the, uh, I guess, students asked for it on the discourse. I have already shared the uh, recording link. Hopefully, that would be uploaded to the YouTube uh, very shortly. Hopefully by Monday. Uh, in case anyone has a the meeting link for that, uh, sorry, not the meeting link, the recording link for that, I can share it right away in case it is required. Yes, sir, please share that. Okay, I'm sharing the link in the chat here. So can someone try accessing this link and see if uh, they can access? Are you guys able to access this recording link that I have shared in the chat just now? The link is opening, sir. Uh, like I'm trying to play the video. Okay. Yeah, I guess if you are able to see the video coming, that means the link is accessible. It will take some time, probably, on the internet speed to start playing the video. Else, you can simply download that video. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. So what I was saying is that uh, there are a few practice lab assignments that uh, we have published on the uh, Seek portal uh, for your practice purpose entirely. And today I'm, uh, you know, going to discuss one of those practice assignments specifically for week four uh, that asks you to create a password beta application that you know changes its behavior based on the input that is entered by the user uh, in an input text box. So I hope all of you must have. Uh, no, I guess uh, read about it before. I'll quickly share my screen and I'll show you what the problem statement of today's application is. So can I ask a doubt regarding to graded assignment week four? Uh, graded assignment week four. So the deadline is not yet over, but uh, uh, it's it's a doubt like uh, so like uh, it's given a radio button uh, and then a text input. So uh, I mean, what is the link? Uh, the one which is given in uh, week four lab assignments, sir. Uh, we have to week create four? a table. Yeah, week four lab assignment. Okay, week four lab assignment. All right, lab assignments yeah. are anyway not created. Yes, please. Uh, okay. Uh, no, uh, the thing is that, sir, like, uh, 
I am getting the HTML page. It's coming. The table is coming. The table is formed also, but I am unable to understand. Is there? Suppose I click on uh, the uh, course ID or the student ID. Suppose I click the student ID and I take the input in the input box. So the radio button or the, and the input text box does it have a relation? Because the code is working fine. I mean, I'm getting the table. I'm just clicking on that that is showing, and uh, then I'm Krishna, taking the input. Are you referring to the Madman lab assignment? Yeah, right. Uh, so it looks like you have joined the wrong session. This session oh, is for modern application development tools. Oh, sorry. I'm so sorry, sir. All right. Uh, does anyone has any other query, or else we can get started with the application that we have planned for the session today? Sure, sir. Uh, just one uh, small piece of information. Uh, in the last session, uh, Narendra sir completed up to props, which is uh, transmitting information from the parent to the child component, but. Uh, we couldn't go through the emit part where it comes from the child back to the parent. So I mean that's something that wasn't covered last time. So in case that's covered in today's session, it's fine. I just wanted to let you know. Uh, actually, today the purpose is different. I'm planning to do the practice lab assignment that is already there for week four, or we'll try to do it for week three as well if the time permits. But hopefully, okay. Narendra would be able to cover it in the next session. So is that the only thing that is remaining? Uh, that means, how do you emit events from child component to parent? Yes, uh, from as far as week four is concerned, yeah, I think that's probably it. All right, that is not a big thing, so uh, that would be covered. Oh, okay. Okay, so let me share my screen. So I hope all of you are paying attention to the practice lab assignments that we are having for each week. Uh, uh, we did have it for uh, uh, week three. We are having it for week four, and similarly, we are going to have it for week five, six, seven. I'm not sure about six or seven, but yeah, we are going to definitely have it for week five at least. Uh, so the problem statement for practice assignment uh, week four, that is lab assignment. So what we have to do is we have to create a very simple uh, kind of application. So uh, that application is going to be named as password meter or something. So what is meant to be done here is we have to create a password input field where the user is supposed to enter some text that need not be hidden. Uh, it can be you know shown or displayed as a you know plain text since we are just uh, right now learning the basic concepts of you. And uh, we need four text labels next to it. Uh, you can have as many as text labels as you can think of. So each of these text label is going to indicate uh, one of the conditions whether the password is uh, you know meeting one of those criteria or not so for example you know one of those label is going to you know show the indication whether the password has at least one lowercase character other one is going to show uppercase another one is going for number uh, special character maybe you can go for you know probably for some length that the password must be at least you know these many characters long Apart from that, you can also think of some other conditions that uh, you can also put in here. And uh, all the labels are initially going to have uh, the red color as their background. And as the user starts typing into the input text box, then the color of those labels that you have put out on the screen, they should change dynamically based on the input received from the user. Uh, 8 to 10, yeah, that is for Mad 1. So, what are application development one on Saturday? It happens from 8 to 10. For 2, it happens from 9 to 11 in the morning. Uh, all right, so what I was saying is that uh, as the user starts typing in the input text box, the background color of those labels uh, that is indicating. Each, each of those labels is indicating one of the conditions whether the password is meeting those or not. It is going to change the background color dynamically. And after that, we can, of course, uh, upgrade this app and we can probably show what the password strength is, you know, depending on the, the number of conditions that password met with. Then we can show the password strength, like is it good, is it bad, or whatever it is. 
So has anyone tried uh, implementing such kind of application uh, before? Using view. Has anyone tried it before? Okay, looks like no. All right. So let me do one thing. Let me just uh, set up a project for this and then. So I'll just quickly set up a project here. So this is going to be a simple enough project. So I uh, you know, would resist creating multiple files here. So initially what I would do is I would start with a index file or an HTML file. And uh, what I can do is I can even write my JavaScript code within this file itself, like uh, we did it in the table-based application or probably we can even do it in a separate file. So just give me a minute, uh, we'll be right back. Yeah, sorry for the delay. Uh, okay, looks like I have also stopped sharing. Let me start sharing again. Okay, so I hope my screen is now again visible to you all. Yes. So just, uh, create a basic HTML template here. Uh, and in this template, I am going to create a root element because I hope you all are aware when we are working with view, we have to bind uh, the view instance with uh, one of the root elements in the HTML. And for that, we have to you know, wrap everything in that root uh, element itself. So let's say I'm creating this element name step. I'll be assigning some ID, some class to it. Uh, let me assign it V4 lab. Uh, now, within this div, I am going to write all of my content. But before that, I have to use the view CDN. So, for that, uh, okay, let me get that. All right. So, uh, we are going to use view 2 uh, for all the sessions, at least for this term. Uh, I know that the official version of view has been changed from two to three, but uh, still we are working with view two as uh, it is still offering the LTS support till the end of this year. So at least for this term, we'll be using view two. But in case you want to use view three, uh, there is no issue at all. There will be minor changes that uh, your application will have to go through. Otherwise, uh, most of the code is going to remain same. Uh, in case you have already learned view 2, then it is very easy for you to migrate to view 3 as uh, even the view docs is offering a migration guide from 2 to 3. So you can also refer to that guide. Uh, there are only a minor differences that uh, you will have to uh, understand. Apart from that, uh, everything else is going to remain the same. So yeah, I have just uh, put this uh, view CDN here for view 2. Apart from that, uh, now what I'm going to do is I'm, let's say, going to create some heading where I'm going to show the title of my application. So let's say three, four, lab assignment, or I can even say passwords. 
password meter or something. So as the problem statement was suggesting that uh, we need a password input text field. So here, of course, we'll be needing uh, an input text field here where the user is supposed to enter the input. So what would I do here is I would create a label. And inside this label, I'm going to you know, give some instructions to the user, enter your password or something. Right? And after that, I can create that input label. Okay. So the type of this input label is going to be text. You can even make it password. Uh, that is OK. Apart from that, uh, we are going to use two-way data binding here, but that I'll do once I create the view instance for this app. Apart from that, what else we are going to have? Uh, OK, we are going to have four labels. So what would I do here is I would firstly create some line breaks. I guess two should be enough. And after that, I would be creating multiple labels. And each of these labels is going to indicate uh, uh, one condition or one criteria. So let's say the first label is going to say lowercase, uppercase, number, and special character. Okay. Password has at least one uppercase character. Or I'm going to put a line break here. After that, I'll do that. One, two, three. Yeah, so we are having five levels here. Uh, but I guess we needed only four. Anyways, I'll see. So one is for uppercase, the other one is for uh, lowercase, the third one can be for uh, password has at least one, I guess, special character. Uh, so this can be digit. Can anyone think of any other condition that we can put here? Uppercase, lowercase, special character, and the digit. Length, length, length of a password. Okay, all right. So password is at least say eight characters long or seven characters long or anything. Uh, anything else? All right, I guess we can just uh, start with these five. Later on, we can add more in case something uh, strikes our mind. So yeah, uh, this is going to be an HTML page. Let me quickly see how is it looking. So this is how it looks like as of now. Uh, the thing we have to add here is the background color of each of these labels is uh, going to be red. This is what the problem statement suggests. And as soon as the user starts typing here, uh, this should change dynamically. Apart from that, uh, anything else? OK, that thing we'll probably think about it uh, when we complete the basic version of this app. Now we are going to create the view instance here. So I hope all of you are aware how do we create view instance as Narendra would have already discussed it uh, in details in the last sessions. So the way we create it is uh, we simply you know use this new operator like we generally do in JavaScript. What you can do is you can even assign this object into a variable here, say like this. But uh, if you are not even assigning it to a variable or you are not creating it as an expression, that is fine too. But for now, let us uh, you know put it in a variable. However, I'm not going to make use of this variable anywhere else. But in case it is required somewhere in the program, you can definitely do that. Uh, in case you want to change the data properties from the console or you know by any other means, so this can be doable. Okay. Now this view constructor is going to accept uh, uh, multiple parameters. The very first parameter is going to be el. So this el stands for element. I hope all of that has already been discussed. So can someone tell me what shall I write here in the EL? That means what is the element this uh, view instance should be binded with? ID of the app. Of the app. And Week what is lab. that ID? Week four, Week lab. four lab, please. Is that the right way? Hash, starting with the hash. Okay, why should we write hash here? 
um, because of the CSS, uh, I think. Uh, this is how we work with CSS selectors. So whenever we are referencing to an ID, we have to use hash. So let's say if I change this, uh, you know, ID to class here, do you think dot. I'll be? You will use yeah, dot. Exactly. Then I can use dot. Okay. Uh, the next thing that uh, we are going to have here is going to be a data. So this is going to be an object. So please uh, remember that whenever we are creating a view instance, the data is supposed to be an object. This data property in a view instance, it is supposed to be an object. But whenever we create this data property in case of a function, oh, sorry, not a function, uh, and a component, a view component, then this data must be a function. Okay. Does anyone know why uh, that is supposed to be a function and not an object? And I only know that the interpolation, that mustache expression doesn't dissolve if you don't put it as a function in component. So see, the reason is that the data that you are going to define here in the view instance, that is going to be shared across all the components in your application because you create only one instance, one view instance for the entire application. But as far as the components are concerned, you can use one component at multiple places in your application, right? You probably can have one component used multiple times on a single view itself. And do you want that uh, each of those component to be sharing the same state or a common state? No, you don't want that to happen. So that's why we have to create it as a function so that each or uh, uh, each component gets uh, their own copy of the data properties that you are defining within that function, that data properties. Okay, so I'm just uh, you know trying to explain you the notion in case you are uh, defining data to be an object, then all of the instances of that component. For example, I create a component named ABC and you are using that ABC component quite a many times in your view somewhere. So uh, if you try to change the state of one of those components, it is directly going to impact the other component as well. That should not happen. At least in most of the cases that should not happen. There may be cases where you want that change to be reflected for the other components, but that can be coded too. But in most of the cases you want uh, you know, one component or the state change of one component to affect another. So that is why uh, that data must be a function in case of components. And here we are defining it as an object because this state is going to be shared across all the components in the application. Is the explanation clear? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And there is nothing preventing us from defining this also as a function, right? It is still work. I mean, uh, at the app level also. Uh, I have not tried this before, but uh, I think it should. Right, because I mean, the examples I see in view three is that they seem to use function for everything. They don't yeah. define it like this at all. In, in view three, you define data as function, yes. Yeah, right. so I think they've just migrated all to function. OK, thank you. Uh, all right, so I'm just uh, you know trying to put a basic structure for a view application. What all properties do we have in the view constructor? So we have this. Uh, EL here that is going to reference to the element, uh, the HTML element this app is supposed to be binded with. Uh, apart from that, we have this data, then comes the computed. So we can also define a number of computed properties in the application if needed. Apart from that, what else we can think of? Uh, we have methods. Anything else? Mm. Okay, we have watch. Now, apart from that, we have a few lifecycle hooks. Not a few, actually, we have a lot of them. I hope the week five content has already been released. You would have started watching those lectures. So, as you will progress watching those lectures, you will see that there is something known as lifecycle hooks that will be introduced in week five, the content of which has already been released yesterday. So, you will get to know about those. So, right now, I'm skipping those things. Uh, we'll be starting with them probably from week six uh, when we'll integrate API in our applications. All right, so now let us see what all data properties do we need in this application. So the very first thing that we need is the string where we are going to store the password that the user enters in the input text box. So that can be, let's say, pass or text or anything, or let's keep it as pass only. So the initial value of it is going to be what an empty string, right? Because this is what we want to display on the input text box when the user opens this application for the first time. So now what I can do is I can just bind this uh, pass 
uh, data variable that I have just created with this input uh, text box here. So can someone tell me how can I establish a two-way data binding? V model. Yes. So I can use V model here. So V model is going to be passed. Now, whatever I write in the input text box, uh, the same will be reflected in this pass data variable as well. Right. Apart from that, now what we need is we need one variable or one data variable for each of these conditions, right? So what we need is let's say we need this uppercase. We need this uppercase. Uh, the initial value of it is going to be say false. Then we need lowercase. And generally, we'll be needing for other conditions as well. But uh, here, what we can do is we can simply say we bind. Uh, we are going to bind the style property here. Mm, so if I say true and false, uh, so I'll have to put the background color as it is. Okay, let's do one thing. Let's create a simple object. Say conditions. And here I'm going to define what all conditions do I have uh, for the password. So now I can say uppercase, then I can say lowercase. Then I have uh, I have special special character. Then I have uh, digit. Apart from that, what else do I have? Length. I have length. Okay. Now, what is going to be the initial value for each of these properties that are also defined in an object called conditions? So again, I can make it false and true, but uh, just thinking a little bit way forward. Mm. Okay, if I directly say true and false, that means I'm going to make it dark red. I'll have to do some more CSS in order to make it a little bit fade. So let me instead do that way. So see, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to use the uh, color codes. So what will I do here is say RGBA, I'm going to use the color format. And here I'm going to define the color of each of those labels. So initially, I hope you all are aware that uh, we are going to have as the red background for, for each of those labels. So for red, uh, the value of R is going to be 255. For G, it will be zero. For blue, it will be zero again. And the alpha value can be something less than one so that the color becomes a little bit fade. It does not become too much dark and you know, so that user is at least able to see the text that is displayed on the screen. Uh, so let me make it uh, say 0 0.5 or something. I guess that should be good enough. Finally, I'm going to copy this and we'll put it for every other label. Commands. Okay. okay. Put commas. You can even put a comma here. Doesn't matter. Uh, all right. And now here, can someone tell me how should I bind this style that I have defined? You know, so many data variables inside this conditions object. How do I bind this here in this label? This is a conditions dot upper case. Uh, conditions dot uppercase. This is all should I write here? So conditions dot uppercase. Is that all? I guess so. So the brackets are not sure. So what is the value of it? That means if you are saying conditions dot uppercase, what is it uh, referring to? What is the value it is representing? So it is representing a color. Oh, okay. okay, let's say background yeah. color input. Yes. Background exactly. Color. So we have to use background color here. So since I have already used double quotes outside, so what I can do is I can either use single quotes inside or I can go with 
uh, camel case here. So I would instead go with camel case. background color and then this is what i can do sorry this is a spelling mistake background color right in case i don't want to do it this way then i can even uh you know do something like this where i say background hyphen color then i can even write it in the kebab case this way i'm deleting one of these as we'll only need one here i'm doing it this way here but the same thing i'll have to you know do for the other labels here so i'll simply copy this and we'll paste it for other labels present so this is going to be upper case lower case this is special digit. This is for name. Uh, fine. This is also done. Okay. Now tell me one thing. If I'll try to open this index.html file in the browser. Would I be able to see the background color as red for each of these labels? Is there anything that we are missing here? Yes, can anyone think of it? What are we missing? No, so it will be red only, I guess. He'll see this now. Okay, so let me open this. All right, so you are able to see that, uh, I guess it is the same page now. Uh, yes, it is. Yeah, so <laughs> the labels are not showing in the red background. The format is showing, sir. <laughs> I coded okay, along. Yeah. Right, I mean, so I can even point out what is the mistake that I have made here? Okay, let me refresh. That's fine. Yes, anyone? Okay, so the thing that we are missing here is we have not embedded this script uh, that app.js in our html file so that is the reason uh, this is not picking up this view object and whatever thing that we have written here this is simply unknown to html right so i'll quickly embed that script here i have added it sir, so that's why it's coming for me yeah okay yeah now it should start working all right so you're able to see this uh, if this color still seems a little bit dark, I can decrease the alpha value a bit. Let me see. I can make it 0 0.4. Will it have any impact? I think that is okay. I'll just uh, make everyone, everything as 0 0.4. Okay, all right. So, everything is coming as this but uh, now as i type anything here uh, nothing is happening because of course we have not written any code for that as of now so now can someone tell me how shall i get started with it we can how shall I get started? Yeah. So can we make each of those as uh, computed properties and write a function for it like uppercase um so you want to make this upper case lower case and each of these conditions as a computed property is it yeah so it will return a green rgba if it meets certain conditions so would that work okay it will return green but when 
so like we should have ah, okay. so it's, event handlers and should we define it in methods like and so what should uh, be the event handler what should be the event first like while entering the input it should be you know we should process the input and based on that uh, it should take actually type password will get very good to change right the pass wow. variable will keep changing as we type the password so you could compute based on that also that is true uh, so we can even use uh, on input event as one of you suggested so that uh, as soon as the value changes in the, in the input text box we trigger some set of code which is going to detect all the changes that have been made the other way we can go with this this you know detecting the value change in this a uh, variable that is passed because we have just seen that uh, we have binded this data variable pass uh, by establishing a two way data map so i guess in the previous uh, two sessions narendra Uh, would have worked with computed properties and methods. So today I would like to work with watchers. Right, as watchers may be something that is new to you that uh, you might have just seen in the lectures and not in the previous two sessions as of now. So I would just like to go with watchers as of now. So when I'm going with watchers, I hope you all understand that means I am going to detect the changes in the uh, variable that is this pass. So I hope you understand what is watcher. Watcher is going to detect any change made. in the data variable that you have to find in the view application as soon as the value changes for that particular data variable the watch for that particular uh, data variable that is implemented that is created here would be triggered that is just like any other function okay and does anyone know how do we create watchers for any variable what is special about them it has an old and new value or new and old value Okay, but how do I define it here? Uh, as I said, it is like a function. So pass bracket. Pass. We know all of you would have heard about constructors. Well, in Python, uh, the constructors do not have the same meaning as that of class name. But in other languages like Java or probably C plus plus, you would have seen that the constructors do have the same name as that of class. Similarly, here when you are defining the watchers, each of that watcher must have the same name as that of data variable for which it has to be created. so since we are defining it for a variable named pass the name of the watcher is also going to be pass since it's a function it is going to accept a few parameters those parameters uh, are going to be the new value and the old value so the very first argument that this watchers uh, or that this watcher uh, will get is the new value so i'll simply say new value uh, the second value or the second parameter that it gets is the old value right and after that i just as i said it is just like a function so you use these curly braces and then you write the implementation or the definition for this particular watch okay so uh, what do you think what is the easiest condition that we can catch out of these five conditions upper case lower case special character one digit and eight characters long which of these is the easiest condition that we can catch here length is quite easy pass dot it length is quite easy so let us just start with the length itself so what would i do here is i would say if now since we are getting two parameters here new value and old value what do you think which value we should be uh, you know writing a code for should it be new value or should it be old value new value yes we should be writing it for new value of course because we want to detect the changes in the latest value that the user has entered right So, do you think we do even need this old value here? I don't think we will be needing it here. In any case, I think only one parameter is sufficient here. So, if there is only one parameter that we are using with the watcher, it must be the new value, or it is always going to refer to the new value. You can even uh, omit the second parameter in case it is not required. I am doing it. Okay. So here, what I am going to say is, I will say if new value. So I hope all of you know that uh, length. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, if you uh, omit the parameter, then what is the variable name? It will be pass itself, is it? If you omit new value also. No, you cannot omit it. Ah, okay. So I have to give some. One parameter must be there. Okay. Okay, sir. Uh, all right. So I hope all of you know that uh, any string value has a predefined property called length in JavaScript. 
so that is what we are going to make use of here so here we are going to check what is the length it should be at least eight characters long so we can say if it is greater than equals to eight then what can we do can someone tell me we should make the background green it's not conditions so no. conditions make the background green for what and how am i supposed to make the background green so, so this here is conditions dot length right okay so i'm going to say this dot conditions dot length conditions dot length yes what should i do a len len matic l e n right that's the name of the variable okay to be r g b a I don't know what all right so green. now i have to write the code for green color here so for green r is going to be zero g is going to be 255 uh, b is again going to be zero and i'll make the alpha value again 0 0.4 that is fine so now let me come back here refresh it and uh, let me type a length of greater than eight and you see as soon as the length you know exceeds the length uh, the password length exceeds the the number of characters by eight it automatically turns into green right so let me quickly do it once again a b c d and then one two three as soon as i'll write another character here then this label will turn into green color like this song okay. so we are able to get it working uh just a small thing here if we are having just a single statement a simple statement as part of this condition we don't need these curly braces i hope you already know these things what you can do is you can even omit those curly braces if the condition has only one uh, statement to it uh, the same thing applies for you know else condition else if condition or even for the loops okay so what i can do is i can even put it in the same line that is fine too. but it's better if i put it in the next line i hope it doesn't give you the feel uh, that we are writing code in Python. I am using indentation just for the readability. Okay. All right, so that is done. Now the next thing, the next challenge for us is to detect or is to find whether the password is having an uppercase character, a lowercase character, a special character, or a digit. So can someone suggest what can we do here? Okay, if you're not able to think about the solution in this particular language, say JavaScript, uh, probably you can think about how would you do it in any other language, say Python. So in Python, I would define a variable with uh, like A to Z and I'll check if that value is in that. So like basically alpha with A, B, C, D to Z or Python has this. So what you're saying is you're going to either define a list or a string and then you will check if yeah. any of the characters. Yeah. Or if we, if we even have this uh, inbuilt function also is alpha and we can check it in uppercase or lowercase in Python basically. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah, we can do that too. Yes. So here also I can define. Question. Sorry. Yes, uh, definitely. Regular, regular, regular expressions work. can work too. But the thing is, do we really need regular expressions here? Because I it's generally simple. avoid using regular expressions uh, to an extent possible, as uh, they prove to be very expensive right, in terms of computation and all. Okay. And of course, it is uh, difficult for uh, especially people who are beginning with JavaScript. All right. So instead, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to use some inbuilt JavaScript uh, functions or methods here. So in that, uh, what I would do is I would try to find out the Unicode value, right? UTF-16 value or the Unicode value for a given character in a string. And then I am going to check for the range, that whether the value that we have, uh, you know, computed, whether it uh, falls in this range. If this falls in this range, then we can say that it is going to be an uppercase character if it is going to be a lowercase character or whatever it is. So in the first tab, I'm going to open the SKI table. And I can open this rapid table here. So for example, if you need to find out that whether a given character is an uppercase character or not, 
you will find that the upper case character starts from uh, number 65. Yeah, here it is. So the upper case characters are sorry. The upper case characters are starting from number 65, and you can just add 96 to it, and they are going to end at 90. Similarly, the lower case characters are going to start from 97 uh, here, and then you will simply add 26 to it, and they are going to add at 122. Right. So the range for upper case character is 65 to 90. Similarly, for lower case character, it is 97 to 122. Similarly, for digits, I guess it will start from 48. Uh, yeah, here it is 48. It will start from 0 and it will go on till 57 because digits are from 0 to 9. For 10, it will be comprised of 1 and 0 together. Right. So we simply have these 10 digits from 0 to 9. Similarly, in case of special characters, uh, so for special characters, if we count space also as a special character, then we can start counting it from 32 and it will go on till 47 where the digit starts from. And I guess this column is also considered as a special character. So we can even say 58 till, I would say uh, 63. And there are certain conditions that apply for you know uh, special characters. It also depends sometimes on the perspective or the context, what all characters you are going to be treating as special characters. So ultimately, the idea here is going to be that we are going to find out the UTF or a Unicode value for a given character, and then we'll try to find whether it fits in this range. If a given character fits in a particular range, we can assume that it is a uppercase character or a lowercase character, depending upon the range it falls. Are you able to understand what I'm trying to say? Yes, sir. Okay. All right, so this is what I'm planning to do. For that, uh, we have a function called care code at, I guess. Yeah, so it is going to return us an integer between 0 to 65,535, representing the UTF-16 code unit. So this is how we are supposed to use it. Uh, so sentence dot char. Okay, all right. So the sentence is basically a string. Char code is the function name, and index is the uh, index or the positioning in that particular string that you have used it along. Okay. So what I would do here is. Uh, firstly, I would have to, of course, run through a loop because I have to iterate over this entire new string. Remember this new value, this is a string and this is also an iterable, right? Uh, so we discussed the differences between iterables and collections. String is not a collection, it is an iterable, right? That means we can still iterate over it via a loop. So I'm just uh, using a for loop here, the simple enough loop. Uh, let me create a variable, say, i. Uh, so can someone tell me when this loop should terminate? We are going to iterate over this string. So what should be the uh, condition here? Less than the length. So index length of, to length of the value, new value. Exactly. So we are going to use new value dot length. And uh, we are going to make an increment one by one. Now, what we are going to do is we are going to, uh, you know, get the value uh, at the very first index, that is at the index zero. So new value, new value dot care code at. Let me copy that. Care code at, and this index is going to be I here. It is going to return as an integer value. So what I'm going to do is, let's say I'm going to store it as a in another variable, say uh, Unicode value. Right. Okay. Now let us go for the very first thing. So this Unicode value is going to tell us what is the UTF-16 code for the index value that we have just iterated on. The very first range that we can check for is, uh, so let's start with this capital A or for the uppercase character. So it starts from 65 and it ends at 90, right? So let us check for this range. So what should I do here? I would write an if condition if uh, Unicode value 
So what should I do here? What is the condition? Should be in between 65 and 90. So it's greater so than. If it is greater than equals to 65, and it is less than equals to 90. Right. If the Unicode falls under this range, we can assume that uh, it is a uppercase character. So if it is an uppercase character, what are we supposed to do here? Change the background of uppercase character to green. Exactly. So I would simply copy this from here and conditions dot. I would make it uppercase and uh, yeah, we have made it green. That is fine. Okay, now the next thing I'm going to check for is, uh, okay, uh, tell me one thing. Now, uh, similarly, I'm going to check for the other ranges. So should I be using if here or should I be using else or else if? Else what do you think? Else if. Will else if suffice or should we use if here? If what do you think? Which will be more optimized? Else if is better. Why else if is better? And what is the drawback of using if here? Well, if will evaluate every single condition, right? But as long as one condition is met, the others don't have to be evaluated. Exactly. So we know that if uh, a given range or a given character falls within a particular range, we know that it is not going to you know meet with any other condition that we are going to define afterwards. So that's why we can use else if so that once a condition becomes true, it does not need to evaluate the uh, conditions written afterwards, right? It can simply break out of that. So here I am going to use else if. And the condition here is going to be for the uh, lower case. So lower case starts from 97, it ends at 122. One twenty two and uh, it is ninety seven. Right? And similarly, I am going to make it lower case. Right? What should be the next range? Else, if uh, let us check for. Okay, let us check for digits first. So digits are starting from 48. They are going till 57. So 48 to 57 is what we need to check. Let me simply copy this instead of writing. Okay, so it is going to be 40, sorry, 48. And it is going to be 57. If this condition is met, then we are going to change the digit background color. Uh, let me check. Okay. All right. Now, there are two things that we can do here. Uh, first is that we can simply use else. That means if a given character is not falling in any of these ranges, that means it is not an uppercase character, not a lowercase character, not a digit, then we'll assume that it is a special character. But generally, what happens in most of the applications is, you know, characters like this, this tilt, this is not treated as a special character. This is not even permitted uh, at certain places. So even space the, is permitted, no, sir, in passwords usually. Yeah, that is true. Yes. So that's what I'm saying. That it generally depends on the context or, you know, perspective to perspective. So uh, probably the range that we can uh, treat here as special characters. Uh, so we'll have to probably think about it. Okay, let us leave out space as of now. Let us uh, consider it from 33. I'm not considered from the you know zero here. That means I'm not going to use the else condition. I'm going to put one more condition from 33 till uh, 47 is what my first uh, special character range is. So from 33 to 47. Apart from that, I can again begin with. Uh, 
So do you consider this Colin as a special character or should we? Yeah, I think it should be. Or uh, we can even consider these. But anyways, uh, it's in our hands. So let us just you know include this. So we are going to include the characters from 58 till 63. This is what we are going to include. Now, if we are going to include it, can someone tell me which operator should I use here? Should I use and or should I use or? Or. or. Yes, we should be using or here because only one of these conditions need to be satisfied. So what was the range I forgot? 58 to 63. Okay. Similarly, you can code for more characters here in case you consider them as special characters. But right now I'm going to leave it as it is. This is giving an error. So I'll wrap this inside another square brackets. Okay. And this one is going to be what is it? But special. Okay. So are we done with it? We have coded for uppercase, lowercase, we have coded for digit, and we have also coded for special character to 63. Okay. By the way, what about dollar? Do we have dollar here? Okay, we have dollar. Okay, I think uh, we have uh, coded for enough conditions. Let us see if all of this is working. So let me come back here. I'm going to first enter a lowercase character. So yes, it does work. Now let me enter a, an uppercase character. It works too. Uh, a special character. Yes, it is also working. And then a digit. That works too. And now we have to go for length. A, I, O, P. So all of that is working. But our application has a major bug. Can someone tell me what is the bug here in this application? It doesn't check for invalid characters. Sorry? Like it doesn't check for invalid characters. Like for you can't have space, for example. That is OK. Means we can put more conditions to that. I'm uh, talking in, in terms of what this application is currently missing with whatever we have coded so far. Is there any major bug in the code that we have written so far? And I'm not talking about any additional features to it. So if we delete uh, uh, the previously entered password, uh, the colors. Exactly. Exactly. So right now you see that the length of the password that I have entered in this input text box is eight. So the moment I delete one, the length of this password becomes seven. But still, we don't see this, you know, label. You know, turned into uh, whatever color it was before. So I guess it was red. Yeah. Similarly, if I you know delete the entire password, it is still showing that all of the conditions are meeting. So this is a major bug in this application. So can someone suggest me what can we do here in order to improve this? So this is the code that we have written. Any ideas, any suggestions? Do we need an else condition in the end? Uh, so if you put an else condition here, yeah, but that, again, we don't, know which condition, yeah, we don't know which condition went false. Not going to work. Yeah. Right, it won't. Computed methods like we should uh, check the length and based on that, should we change the color in computer? Only based on length. We set a default false. I mean, oh, default yeah. for every condition, we should check in computer and based on the live condition, should we like change the color? I was thinking set it default that it has failed and then check each condition. Uh, but where should we set it? Uh, you know, false as the default value. We have already done it here. 
Yeah, yeah. Again, on uh, each time we check it when it changes, maybe then I don't so where, know. So where should we again assign it? What is the suitable place for to be there? Uh, before the if condition starts, maybe there. Mm, yes, exactly. We can do it here. Uh, that is the easiest solution. So what I can do is. Mm. Okay, fine. Let's do it. So this dot conditions dot uppercase equals to what? Equals to this. And I'm simply going to copy this thing. Put this thing. Semicolons. I have been missing semicolons all along. It should be red or green. It should be red. Red. Uh, just a minute. Yeah, sorry. Uh, okay, so what I have done is I have made everything is 255 initially. So this is going to say that everything uh, comes out to be red as soon as this watch is triggered. So what we are assuming is that whenever this function is getting triggered or whenever there is a value change in this pass, what we are assuming it, assuming is that no condition is met. And after that, we are changing the conditions based on the uh, inputs received from the user. So this is how we'll be able to you know, improve that bug. So now if I the sorry, it's all uppercase. I think variable has to oh, change. So we could also write the reset function and just call it here, right? If you want to. Like yeah, of course. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. So right. Simply call the function and call this, this every time. Right. Okay. You can yeah. Uh lower case, uh, what else we have? We have special. We have digit. The last thing remaining is left. Right, so A, B, 6, 5, hash, L, O, B. At the moment I delete it, it again turned back into red. Yes. Yeah, all right. So we are able to achieve uh, whatever the assignment, you know, ask us to implement. So this is it. This is the uh, uh, what this assignment wanted you to implement. Now there is just uh, another thing that I wanted to add to this application very quickly. That is going to be a meter. So uh, what I want is, let's say at the bottom here or probably somewhere in the middle of the screen, let us keep it at the bottom as of now. Let's not focus about the style on the styling part of it. So what I want is that uh, it should be showing uh, an appropriate message depending on the number of conditions that the password is meeting with. For example, if there is only one condition that is meeting, uh, then I would say that the password strength is say, something like very bad. If two are meeting, then it is bad. If three are meeting, it is average. If four are meeting, it is like good. And if five are meeting, it is like very good or excellent or something like that. And if there is nothing or no conditions, or none of the conditions is meeting here, then I would say that uh, it is not a valid password at all. I am assuming that uh, a password cannot be created uh, without any of these conditions being satisfied. That means if I try to write any of the characters say this, this is not a, a valid password. So yeah, such kind of thing I want to implement here so that the uh, user also gets a immediate feedback uh, what the password strength is. So for that, what I would do is I would simply add a label in my uh, HTML file here, uh, label. And in this label, I'm going to say password uh, password uh, strength and all right let me create another uh, data variable here so let's name it as strength itself strength 
I don't know what the default value is going to be, but uh, let's do it. Uh, should I use it as a complete property or data variable? Anyway, let's go with data variables. So I'll simply keep its strength here. And by default, as the initial value, I'm assuming that it is not a valid password. So I would say, please enter a valid password. Right, just like. Uh, so each time when all of this, all of these things happen, uh, we'll have to add some more code that gets triggered after this has completed its, its execution. So like one of you was suggesting that we can simply move this to another function and can call that uh, call that function every time this function is invoked. Now let us do it this way. So the code for this you know meter that we have just created, I'm going to create it in a method. Say uh, the name of this method is going to be say calc strength and uh, this function is going to do certain things so can someone tell me what should i be doing here i basically need to count the number of conditions that are satisfied any ideas what can you do here How do I know whether a condition is satisfied or not? Depending on the value, right, of these uh, okay. properties defined under this conditions object. So I need to I check that how. Okay, all right. I have a count of the true conditions. So you said right, it is zero. Yeah. Now what should I do? Well, I was thinking you can add a count at the overall data level and just add it when whenever the conditions are being processed. Conditions are being tested. If if they are two uppercase and if uppercase becomes true twice, it'll count maybe count it as for two then. We need to count it only once, right? We could reset, no? Right. Please repeat. Uh, so suppose uh, I, I'm not sure, but in the if condition where we are checking for an uppercase mm -hmm. condition. And there are two characters that are uppercase. Will the count increase yeah. twice if we put it inside the if then? Uh, I mean, at the time of the the counters. Uh, what are you saying? Reset the counters? No, no, what I was saying was we define a count variable at the data level. And then uh, add one every time a condition a test passes. Uh, but okay. I don't it's think that we even need to worry about this pass. What we can simply do is we can iterate over this object. See, uh, that string that the password user is entering in that input text box may have multiple characters. But if you are right. you know, making right. a decision right. based on these values, then I guess there should be no ambiguity. Oh, okay. Okay. Good. Good. Nice. Yeah. Right. So what I can say is uh, I can simply iterate over this. Uh, say for. In uh, conditions, and uh, here, what can I do is I can simply check if uh, this okay. I'll also have to make it this dot conditions. So if this dot uh, sorry, this dot condition, okay, what is happening? This dot conditions. I hope this is okay. Sir, you could do just for any of this conditions, right? And you will just get the individual. Uh, yeah, individual. we can even do this off as well. Yeah, fine. So we can simply check if L any equals to equals to. Uh, let me get it from here. So if yeah, these values are matching. Then what I can say is that uh, I am going to make an increment to my count variable. Okay. So again, I am just having. Yeah, sorry. It should be green, right? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, yeah. So again, I am having just one condition here or one statement. So see, this is an if statement, and this count plus equals to what is a part of this statement. So 
uh, what we are having here is we are having just one statement as part of this loop. So that's why I'm not using curly braces. Okay. I'm going to leave it as it is. Let me put a semicolon here. Uh, now we can put multiple if and else conditions that what the value of this count variable is. And depending on that, we can set the or change the value of the strength data variable. So the very first thing we are going to check for is C O U and T equal to equals to five. So that means if all the conditions are satisfied, I would change this dot strength to what? Uh, I can either make it excellent, uh, very good, good, average, bad, very bad. Okay, let me make it very good. And then I have else if count equals to equals to four. In that case, I'm going to make it only equal. Uh, four, three, two, one, and then we are going to have an else condition. So five, four, three, two, one. Right. So this is going to be average. This is going to be bad or something. This is going. Oh, let me make it poor. Very poor. And else is going to say this dot strength. If none of the conditions is satisfied, I would again get back to the default message that is please enter a valid password. Okay. Uh, is there anything else that is required here? So the color scheme has to be green, right? You're counting for greens, not for reds. Sorry? The, you're, okay, you're okay. Yes, sorry. So I copied it from. Uh, okay, this should be right. Okay, so based on these conditions, I'm doing it here. All right. Now, what would I do is I would simply call this function here at the end of my watcher. So this dot delk string is what I would be invoking. Similarly, I could have you know simply moved this code into a function and keep calling this function every time whenever this watcher is triggered, just like I'm doing it for delk string. Right. Uh, Okay. Let us see. Uh, okay, so we are having this password strength is please enter a valid password. Okay, this is not changing. Okay, so there is some issue. It is happening here. What is that? So, Kelp strength is being invoked. What is this? Let me see. Okay, so okay, so what is saying is this dot conditions is not iterable. All right, so we are working with objects. Okay, fine. So we are working with objects. Uh, this works for array. So I'll have to make it in. Uh, apart from that, then this, I'll have to make it this dot conditions dot ELE. I don't think dot ELE will work. Conditions dot ELE. Well, even in the, you have to do square brackets. So we yeah, have to use the square brackets. So if this happens, and we are going to make it. Yeah, OK, fine. If something is happening, just a minute. Mm 
So the debug message you added, print, maybe that's what's calling this. It's your console.log, I think you've done for him, sir. I don't think so. The print hello, sir. I have added mm, that one. I have added Python here. I should have added console. Anyway. No, it is due to something else. I don't know. What is it? So you have to refresh, right? Yeah, I will refresh. Okay, fine. So now you are able to see that uh, uh, this condition is changing here. So we have three uh, lowercase characters. So this lowercase label is uh, green. The remain tie like the uppercase character. So this changes to poor. And uh, a special character, it changes to average. Then one digit is zero. And then we have to make it eight characters long. So you, I, the moment we do it, it becomes very good. And then as soon as I'll start uh, reducing the number of characters, it becomes good. Average, poor, very poor. And please enter when possible. So that okay. Off, it was because it yeah. was an object, is it? An object you can't iterate using off. Is that right? Yes, yes. We cannot use off on objects. It only works for addis. Okay. Okay, all right. So I believe that's it for this application. Let me see if there was anything else to it. Yeah, I think we have already covered that part. So yeah, fine. I'll quickly add up. Uh, we are here so that it comes up in the next line. It's a little bit good. Fine. Okay, this was a simple enough application. I hope you would have understood the logic. Uh, we have used uh, only basic view constructs here, like data methods. We have used watches. Is this might be something that you would be using for the first time. Compute properties, I guess you have already used extensively. So I thought of not uh, using it uh, at least for this session. Mm. All right, fine. So let me know in case you guys have any issues with this application or whatever we have written so far. Does anyone of you no, have a general question? question? It's just yeah. more a general question. Like, um, if you use a Flask app, then this mm -hmm. app for case script has to go into which folder? I mean, does it have to be in the main folder itself? Does it have to go into static? Uh, yeah, yeah. On, for the Flask app, if we, if we were to run the same thing using a Flask server. See, conventionally, you should keep it in the static folder so that you can use URL function, URL for function in order to load your JS file into any of your HTML file that you have used. OK, OK. Oh. That's another question from me. What if we change the HTML text box type to password? Would it still work mm -hmm. or would it get? Yeah, of course. It still that means I could write JavaScript, I could embed JavaScript code to read other people's passwords. I mean, I, if I make it like yes, a of course. browser component. Yes. Okay. okay. It is still working. Potentially. So, a browser plugin could potentially read my passwords. If there is a malicious script, yes. Okay. Right. okay. Cool. Uh, okay. All right. So, I hope uh, the logic for this application is uh, clear to everyone. All right, the next thing now I would like to take up by the remaining time for the session is week three lab assignment as well. I guess week three has already been over uh, the last week. Uh, but there is also a practice assignment to it. For screen pass, I guess that was quite simple. I don't uh, really need to tell you about that thing. But yeah, I wanted to focus on the tic tac toe application. Is that exercise might have been a little bit difficult for uh, beginners to you know start with. So I would just quickly like to tell you that how you can. Uh, you know, make this change that was suggested in this uh, lab exercise here. I uh, just wanted to know that how many of you have already tried or you know successfully implemented this.
has anyone looked at the week three lab assignments before yes i'm trying i've not yet got the solution i'm not copying yours i'm trying to do it myself not yet successful okay okay anyone else who would have tried doing it before okay all right so let us quickly you know try to solve this problem as well so what we have to do is uh, i hope all of you were able to access the gitlab repository where this application is hosted right uh, so yeah and hyperlink is also present here in this exercise apart from that this supplementary contents also uh, show v3 and v5 code bases so you can also access those uh, gitlab repositories via these hyperlinks so as you know that in v3 uh, professor nitin tried creating a you know tech tech to application and uh, as this lab assignment exercise we asked you to make certain changes to it uh, you know so that you can uh, enhance the experience of the user by uh, playing that game so this is what i'm going to you know do right now what i would do is i would simply try to clone that uh, application as of now to my system so i guess uh, does anyone has any doubts on this application or shall i close it i'll open the new application now Okay, fine. I think I can close it. Probably I can host it on the Rappelit, and I can share you the access link for that. Uh, here it is. So I could simply clone it. Uh, the name can be picked back to uh, is it then yes it is fine so i can close this gitlab repository now it is there what we have to do is we have to uh, basically keep a track of the number of wins registered by each of these players okay so let me open that app uh uh okay let's make this in the view of course uh, let's want to wait in the other and here okay this is my sort of nice right all right so let's do it in this one uh, composed components uh, what is the html file being used with this is it index.html it is using tic tac 2 all right so we have to use this fine okay close this and we can open this okay so what we have to do is we have to So we have to add uh, uh, some paragraphs or some text like this, which is going to keep a track of the number of wins, losses registered by each of these users, and of course keeps track of the number of draws. So the very first thing I would like to ask you all is, where shall I add this HTML? That means if I want to show all of these data, all of this data, where should I uh, display this, or where should I write the HTML for? Any ideas? The template, sir. Should it be in the template? Yeah, definitely. We'll have to write it in the templates. Uh, so we are going to write it for this component, that is board component, because this tick component is what? This tick component is referring to each of these boxes here, right? So we should not be writing our HTML code here since uh, the number of wins, losses, uh, this is going to be for the entire board and not for a particular box here inside this board. Okay, so we'll be putting it inside the board component templates property, and uh, should we put it 
above this pan or after or below this pan is something that we can decide probably we can put it uh, okay we can put it on the top so what would i do is i would simply copy this i would copy this and i would paste it here okay and i would wrap it inside a say paragraph tag it will be easier for me right please let me know if there is anything uh, uh, that you are not able to understand right now i have just started writing the html so i hope that should be okay as of now okay so we have created these paragraph tags here it's been success process. okay the very first thing is that since we have to display all of this data on the ui we have to keep track of this data in the application as well and for that we will have to create the data variables too so since we are writing all of this code in the board component we will be creating some more data variables in this board component data function property right so what i would like to ask you all is that how many properties do we need in total in case we want to display this information to the user that means we want to show the number of wins registered by each user number of losses and the number of draws what do you think how many data properties do we need in total we could have two right one for x and one for o probably Okay, one for x and one for o. Then how do you count for draws? Three, so like loss, wins, and draw. Okay, loss, wins, and draw. Oh, yeah, that is draw can be common. Yeah, draw can be common. X wins, x uh, sorry, one object for x wins and losses. One object for o wins and losses, and um, uh, or actually just one is enough. Right? X wins will be zero losses, right? Sorry. Yep. X wins will X be equal will to be O losses. losses, right? Yeah, X wins will be equal to O losses, correct? So total, as as you said, maybe total X wins and draws. Okay. All of this is going to start from zero. So one is total. You said the other one is X wins. Uh, that is again zero. Uh, the next thing is X losses. Or let's just keep. It is also going to be zero. Is there any other property that we need? Mm, total x wins, x loss. I guess that is fine. Mm, yeah, we should be able to find all the data. Yes. So let me make it x loss. Thanks. Okay. So we have x wins here. We have x loss here. We will talk about draw later, but. Uh, what should i write in place of o wins what should i write here in o wins x loss exactly it is going to be x loss and the loss is going to be x wins now how do i find out draw so for that we can simply use the formula say total minus X wins minus X loss, right? This is going to give us the total number of draws. Mm. Come we, to think of it, we just need X win, X loss, and draws. Maybe we don't need total. Total can be calculated. We don't yeah, need total. Fine to, right? Mm. So let me look at the conditions, which will be easier. So even draw is here. Anything is fine. You can even create a draw here, or you can even create right, a total. Right. Here. Everything is fine. So I would simply copy paste this formula. Yeah. Okay. Now if I open this application, uh, where is it? Here it is. So we are able to see all this information here on the top. Just that uh, this data won't be populated because we have not written any code when the values of these variables will change. So for that, what would we do here is we already have so many comments added here, so we don't really need to understand this code right now. Of course, uh, I hope you all can understand this code and you have enough time. So I would just go by the comments here and I would assume that uh, this is the place where 
uh, access winning. So I would be adding the required code here. So if access winning, what else should I do here? The very first thing I should be doing is I should uh, make an increment to this X wins. Apart from that, I should make an increment to uh, total. Is that right? Is that right? And similarly, when O is winning here, so I should be making an increment to total. That is fine. But should I be making an increment to X win or should it be something different? That's uh, I hope I'm audible. Okay, so it is going to be what was the variable name? It is x loss. Yeah, it is x loss. Uh, triple s. There is only two s. Fine. Uh, so we have taken care of x wins. We have taken care of o wins. Now we have to take care of in progress. That is fine. We have to take care of this total. So for total, we just need to make an increment to uh, total number of games, right? I hope that's it. Mm. No X wins, the total wins. Here the total. Yeah, I hope this should work fine. Let me see. Mm. Okay. Yeah, all right. As soon as this O wins, we are able to see that X has registered a loss here and O has registered a win. But again, there is a big problem here. See, the game has already ended. We are able to see this data here. In order to play this game again, what can I do? Can anyone suggest me what can I do in order to play this game again? Without losing this data, that is an important thing because the moment I reset this, uh, this entire data gets lost. So I want to retain this data and I want to keep playing this game without resetting this information. You have to refresh, uh, reset the uh, game board on one, right? Uh, sorry, looks like I was on mute. So yeah, does anyone has any idea? How can we, you know, allow the board should be reset once any of them wins. We should add that in the code. Okay, the board should be resetted as soon as a player wins. Mm, fine. Okay, all right, we can do that. Mm. What we can do is we can have a button here that says play again or that says play or play again or whatever it is. Next, we can decide. Uh, so when the game is in progress, we will keep that button disabled. And as soon as the game gets over, that means either one of these wins or uh, they register a draw, we'll simply enable that button so that user can click on it. Uh, in that case, the board will be automatically reset it but uh, we'll retain this information. That means this information will not get lost. So yeah, this is equivalent to what you have suggested. I guess Anusha has suggested this. I think we can implement this one too. Yes, sir. like this play again, uh, have in one of the versions which sir implemented, it had the play again uh, button, sir. I think in JavaScript version. Okay, it had JavaScript. Uh, okay, all right. So let us quickly try to do that here. 
uh, but wait if we want to play again button mm, then let us try doing that i am not currently sure but let us see so if i'm adding a button here so let's say a again so i am going to create a method here so the methods are created here so let me create play again okay. and so this happens what should i do is so if the user is clicking on this button what that means is the user wants to reset the board so what can he do in order to reset the board can someone tell me in order to reset the board i'll have to reset these two variables to their default values so i would say this dot board equals to initial thing and similarly this dot next is equals to 1 Let's see if this works if i click on this play again yeah all right this is working so x o x o x o yeah all right so if we click on play again uh, the data is still here and we are able to reset the board but the problem here is that the user is able to uh, click on this play again button even when the game is in progress so what i want is that uh, when the game is in progress this button should remain disabled so that the user cannot uh break out of the game in mid so for that what we can do is we can make use of disabled property can someone tell me what can i do i hope you understood the requirement i want this button to be disabled uh for the time being when the game is in progress can anyone suggest something what can be done maybe start with default state as disabled and on victory or draw we set it to enabled mm, yes definitely we can do that so what we can do is we can again create a flag variable here and let's initialize it with the true or false let's initialize it with false and then we have this disabled property here and in this disabled we are going to keep flag so initially we want the button to be disabled so if the value is false so disabled is false that means the button will be enabled so we can either make it true or what we can do is we can put a not operator here any of these is fine either we make it true or we put a not here if i come back here yeah this button is disabled fine so now what we have to do is we have to enable this button again when the game gets over so when is the game getting over game is getting over at these places so i would make this dot flag equals to uh true false and disabled one second so if it is false that means the button is it is becoming true disabled is true okay we have to make the disabled false fine so i'll make it true then Well, I'll make it true here as well, and I'll make it true here too. Let's see if this works. Play again button is disabled. Let us see which player wins. All right. So as soon as X wins, uh, we are getting this play again button here. The moment we click on it, let us play again. All right.
okay i want to make a draw here so Right, so it's a draw. Fine. So we are able to get all of this information, and yeah, we are able to get the required thing running. Fine. So this is okay. All right. Have you understood what we have changed here, or what we have added here? I don't think we have changed anything in the previous version. We just have added a few more things. A few more things. All right. So any doubts with it? Whatever code additions we have done so far. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, so today we have covered week three and week four practice lab assignment. I hope those who were not able to do it before, I hope they will be practicing at this time. I would try to share the code that we have written for the password meter application. Uh, on the discourse once the session gets over, and I would suggest all of you to you know roll out your own versions, try adding more features to that, uh, try improving the user interface for that uh, simple uh, UI, and do whatever stuff you want to try. Right. Uh, we have uh, also entered into the week five, so lifecycle hooks will be introduced in this week, and from next week onwards, we will start integrating API in our uh, view applications. So. That's why we are introducing lifecycle hooks in this week, so that you understand what is the significance of having lifecycle hooks and how are we supposed to make API calls uh, so that we can fetch the data as soon as the page loads or uh, whenever it is required. Of course, we can uh, fetch the data in the methods, but sometimes what happens is as soon as the page loads, we want an API call to be triggered. And this is where exactly those lifecycle hooks come into the picture. Uh, I hope uh, that you will be able to understand once you uh, finish watching the lectures for week five, especially the screencast part of. Okay, so I guess that's it. Uh, that's all I have for the today's session. Uh, please let me know in case you guys have any doubts uh, from the today's session or anything in general. Sir, so just one question. I mean, this is more to do with the project. And I'm still gunning for getting the project done if possible by this term itself. Uh, but will up to week five, week six be uh, decent enough to build the whole app? Or I know there are certain salary and some other things that are being taught later on. Mm -hmm. But it is the bulk of the project, as in uh, the, the core of the project, can be built using Till week, six, yes. week five, week six. Week six. Okay. So in week six, we'll be introducing you how to integrate APIs with your application. And that is what is extensively required in the project. So yeah, till week six, you should be able to, you know, implement the major part of the project. And in week right. nine, I guess the salary will come in, but I guess you will still require some knowledge from week eight, because this is uh, the place where we are introducing the token based authentication. Since this time we are asking right. you to use a proper login mechanism that would be required. So yeah, week six, you should right. be able to put a basic layout and then the authentication and the backend or the batch jobs, you will be able to integrate once uh, you get familiar with the weeks nine or 10 content. Okay, so that's almost coming up to the end of uh, that project. Uh, Correct, I hope uh, you all, uh, all of you have already received the announcement uh, regarding the extension of the deadline for the project submission. So those who have already completed their theory courses in one of the previous semesters or uh, previous terms, and they are doing their project courses in this term. For them, the deadline remains the same. That is March 31st. But uh, those people who are doing the theory course in this semester or in this uh, it, term, as well as the project course, for them, the deadline has been extended by a week or so. I guess it is 9th of April, if I'm not wrong. That is Sunday. I guess that is all what I remember. Yes, and there is no possibility of just extending it by one more week because week 11 kind of completes on 9th exactly. And uh, I think week nine is, I mean, sorry, week 11 is where I think you're, uh, the, some of the. Uh, I think, I think the week 11 finishes. Right? Or nine is Sunday. Exactly. 
Yes. The week 11 finishes that day, right? Correct, correct. And the project also finishes the same day. So, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. All right. I guess that's the mode. Uh, uh, that's the okay, most that uh, we could have done day. that time. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if there is any other further extension possible because this time, as you know, we are streamlining the process for the people who are going to enter the degree level. And for that, we really have to make sure that we don't leave any student, you know, in mid and their viva is pending or something. So for that, we really need some time to schedule their vivas and complete the entire process. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay, let me stop sharing my screen. So is there any other question that any one of you would want to ask now? So in the next week, we are going to also start with a very important topic that is promises. I'm not sure if that is going to happen on the Thursday, but uh, if not Thursday, then we'll definitely do it on the next Saturday. So promise is very, very important thing as far as the JavaScript language is concerned. So I would suggest you to, you know, attend the next Saturday session. Uh, uh, because in that session, we are going to, you know, extensively work on the promises Sunday and that is going to be really beneficial. Yeah, sorry. So Sunday's quiz, no, sir, like Saturday, there will be session before the quiz. Okay, next Sunday, Won't you guys have a quiz. Fine, fine. I understand. Uh, so next Saturday, I guess it will be a revision session. I don't think we'll be having the regular live session that day. Uh, so we'll have to have another live session the next week or we'll try to do it uh, next to next week so that it doesn't coincide with your quiz exam. So yeah, we don't want to overload you, overload you guys with the quiz exam and all of these new concepts. So I would try to schedule an additional session after 26th when your quiz exam gets over. Okay, sir. Okay, so uh, today is week five. All right, it is scheduled at the end of week five. Fine. Yeah, but promises is something that uh, you really need to understand in case you want to, you know, work with JavaScript. That is the fundamental concept that is going to be asked in each and every front end interview you will be appearing for in the future, and that is going to set up your foundations. Okay, so I guess that's it from my end. Uh, let me stop the live streaming for the session too.